Oh, we're, we're live. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. Uh, tonight's session, suggested topic. We had a few topics suggested, and you can keep going as uh, as the session progresses in Q&A. But, of course, before uh, we do this, and he's not in the room, but I'm going to show off uh, this week's. Is it this week's or is it last week's? I don't remember. But uh, this week's. I think it was actually last week's, and I might as well show you the image. Sorry here. have to share my screen. There you go. Uh, Richard Flynn's Triffid Nebula M uh, M20, Messier 20, and uh, this is a beautiful object, and uh, you guys probably all know Richard Flynn because he keeps winning these things. He's putting out some great images, usually in narrowband. But uh, this is an RGB image of his, and uh, just as impressive as some of his others. And uh, let me see. We did share this last week, yeah. So, uh, well, Richard knows. if he's, he's always welcome to come on. Because we don't have a topic, I'll tell you, I was asking him about some of his strategies for narrowband. Um, and uh, I am thinking of switching up everything I do in narrowband. Uh, basically... Uh, he uses H alpha bin one by one, and the other narrowband channels he uh, uses bin two by two, and basically that allows you to pull a bit more detail out of the objects where there's very little there there. Um, and I, that's well with nebula season coming around, and uh, I'm going to be hitting some of the objects that I haven't or that I have hit in the past but just want to make better, of course, this time around they're going to have diffraction spikes. So uh, we will see. Uh, but of course, uh, Richard, thank you for uh, submitting your image. Um, oh, interesting that you see that screen. And uh, Adam, the um, new image of the week for this week is up as well. Chris oh, Campbell, this is M11. I have to reset my screen or refresh my screen. Oh, yeah, okay, Chris Gomez, nice, M11. Let me pull that up while I'm at it and uh, show up at one. Back to this screen share. You know, screen share button's getting in the way of me clicking screen share. Um, yeah, Chris, uh, nice image here. A lot of nice dark streams in there uh, coming out of the bottom of M11. Um, well, Chris, you're welcome to come on next week and talk a bit more about it. One more time, I'm going to take my screen back. I'm going to probably do a lot of this tonight because I'm going to be reading questions over on the side. All right, there. Okay, yeah, so as I was saying, tonight's session is an open session. Um, and we had a few, uh, right off the bat, people were uh, talk. Uh, had questions and uh, I know not all these people are live here tonight, but uh, they some good questions, so I'm going to go right out and ask them. Uh, first topic that actually came up was remote imaging versus local imaging. He'd be interesting, interested in knowing how remote imaging has affected our engagement with astronomy. Are there negatives from an astronomy community standpoint? Less social, for example. Uh, less social involvement with clubs, outreach, star parties. Maybe it's created a more community involvement through a larger imaging network, teams, just a suggestion. Um, and uh, so it's interesting. Um, I'm going to give you my opinion on this first because that's what I do. Uh, the, um, we, have, we have at least one remote imager in the uh, room tonight, but I've heard it go both ways. The remote imagers, they, they never show up at the club functions. They never do this. Um, and then we have the uh, solo remote imagers or the guys who team up. Uh, so, so it goes both ways. Uh, at the same time, look at us. We're on Google+, Plus and we basically do this every week, and we've kind of gotten to know each other and, and been involved via this type of networking thing. And uh, I'm sure that if you look at a bunch of the people sharing peers, um, a lot of them may not have met them each other in person, but they uh, continue sharing their data and probably comparing their results. Um, so from a social standpoint, um, are there negatives? Yeah, there might be, but uh, astrophotography in general, um, 
I'm not sure it's the most social activity. We spend a lot of time, or at least I spend a lot of time alone in the dark. Um, so uh, that that's basically my opinion. Uh, but I am gonna I'm gonna reach around the room or or reach into the room and uh, basically ask if anyone has another opinion on that. I got an opinion. Go ahead, Alex. I, I think you need to. Um define some things here. The question originally was about remote imaging versus local imaging. And um, that's, that's a real simple, I think, way of breaking it down. If what you mean is what uh, Eric does, for instance, he's got uh, a rig out in California and um, he's living back in, um, in uh, Illinois and he's got a buddy with that rig. I don't know where he's from. Eric, but um, uh, and these guys obviously are working together a whole lot more than they ever did before, but they're far away, and then that gives Eric an opportunity to share, as Adam said with us. So that's remote imaging, true remote imaging. Also, do you mean automated imaging, where you can set your um, system up uh, to um, Adam? Your wife has changed. Yeah. I've got some friends over. <laughs> Your wife has seriously changed. I mean, we see people walking by every every once in a while on Sundays. <laughs> oh, this is different. Anyway, um, as opposed to automated imaging, um, where I can go out to my um, uh, uh, observatory and then set it up and start it going, and then I'll take my dob out. And I'll become a um, I'll become a visual observer out on the field with everybody else, and uh, automated imaging has really enabled me to be more social out there. I can I can mess around with everybody else because I'm not doing anything as far as the imaging goes. The imager is doing everything except for like last night and the night before when I was in trying to get the thing to work because I had taken up Tolga's uh, suggestion of updating my computer and, and it all got screwed up. But at any rate, um, on a normal weekend, uh, when we're having a star party out at Goat Mountain, I can go out there and there'll be 30, 40 telescopes and imagers and everything out on the field, and I'll be out there with them because automated imaging is doing everything all by itself. So in that sense, it's, it's actually increased my ability to socialize with everybody. But I think imaging in general decreases your ability to socialize. When I go to a, a star party where it's basically visual observers, everybody's wandering around and visiting with each other and seeing who's got what and comparing, you know, running from one scope to another that's on the same object to see what it's like and stuff like that. And that, you know, other than every once in a while you go past an immature and say, how's it going? And he says, grump. Well, you know, that's, that doesn't happen with imaging. Um, when you're at a star party. So um, there are some negatives if what you're talking about is everything should be the way it was back in the golden era when it may or may not have ever, ever existed like that. But I think automated imaging has really opened up your ability to go out and play with people. It, um, and the internet in general and the remote access to, to imaging stuff has increased your ability to take pictures and then come and talk about it um, across around the world. We've got people listening right now are going to check it out on YouTube tomorrow morning from all over the world and uh, that couldn't be done without some of this automation going on. Yeah, Adam, I might have an, a, a small opinion about this. I would agree that the, the imaging part of it, whether I do it here or whether I do it remotely in California, is not a social experience, but sharing the images is. So I'm now sharing more images with more people because I'm imaging out in California and I've got to know the people at the Sierra Remote Observatories. Mm, you know, it's not like we're uh, buddies and go out and drink, but, but we exchange emails, we exchange images, and it's been really a nice experience. But the process of imaging, in any case, like you said, is not social. But I, I mean, if you can arrange it, whether financially or otherwise, I would say remote imaging uh, allows you to look at different objects, perhaps from a darker sky with a different telescope, and that's a good thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Coming at it two different ways, um, because I did, uh, I had a club member who I think takes amazing images, uh, club member here, and uh, does some really cool stuff, 
And he went out to Cherry Springs, and he didn't bring his setup with him. And he said, uh, yeah, you know, well, he didn't bring his imaging setup. He just brought his visual setup. And he said, yeah, you know what, I went out there to have fun, not to image. And kind of surprised me. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I know exactly what Alex is saying about bringing a dob, because uh, when I go up to my lake house and I bring my imaging gear, I have lots of friends around, and I think it'd be awesome to look through the telescope, but I've got my stuff hooked up to it, and I don't want anyone walking near it. It's just the way it is. But um, funny how it goes both ways. Uh, I see another microphone muted. Josh, go ahead. <clears throat> that's Well, that's why I love star parties, because... I guess once you're imaging long enough, it doesn't really take much to get your imaging rig getting up and going. So, you know, um, you get you get your image run going, and then then you can walk around and talk to people. I don't think I've found something that you can talk more about than imaging and the acquisition and the processing and all that stuff. So, um, I don't know. I I like how we get to chat on here all the time, um, but to me, nothing replaces. Uh, going out and hanging out with people and chatting about stuff. I mean, it's just en endless things to talk about and endless uh, skills to develop, and it's just, uh, I really enjoy it. So I don't know I don't know that I would say do one thing or another. If you can do both. But. Yeah, I'll add one other thing. Uh, my, my experience at star parties and stuff like that is that generally the people that are going to be more social are social be to begin with, right? You know, so... While I'm out there imaging and stuff, I try to get things set up so it's fairly automated, and then I can go around, chat, you know, talk to people, look through their scopes. I generally try to bring two setups, a visual and a, you know, photographic setup, right? And that way I can look through mine while I'm doing astrophotography and stuff like that. And to me, it's it's great, you know. It's be I'm able to collect photons from a nice dark location or something like that at the same time as being able to to socialize and everything, right? Yeah. Lots of good points. The other thing I always, uh, another question coming in. Um, another thing I always uh, say about astrophotography in general is, or, or when trying to translate astrophotography to some sort of educational outreach program is that um, I do astronomy and I take my pictures with me so I could show them to the people at work. And so I could show them to other people and get those people interested in astrophotography. So even though I'm kind of diverging from Am I choosing a less social form of it by, uh, or, or is someone choosing a less social form of it? Uh, it's interesting because it gives me a reason to talk to people that, about something that I'm interested in. And usually, um, it's, it's, not, it's honestly hard to find people who aren't impressed by these pictures, who aren't, uh, everyone I talk to, they say, oh, I watch the Cosmos, or I, wa I, I like that universe show. And uh, I don't know, gives you other... Uh, social venues. Uh, there are other social venues for what we do, and what we do might require us to go somewhere that might seem anti-social in a sense. Um, but that was that was kind of a good uh, that was a good uh, run on that topic. Uh, I am clicking over because I, have, I wanted to read the other one uh, just so I get it right. Um, this will pro this deserves and should get its own show. Uh, and that's what he was asking for. How about a show, and this is by Andrew, how about a show on how to get the most out of your DSLR imaging? Uh, CCDs have taken center stage in most of the imaging discussions, but he knows it would be nice for us bums who have not upgraded to a CCD yet to know how to get the most out of DSLRs. Ooh, maybe we could get someone like Tony Hallis. That would be a good idea. Uh, he's done some amazing things with DSLRs. It would be nice to, to have him share some of his tips and tricks if he's willing to share. Um, I'll, I'll try and reach out to him. Uh, just a reminder, we also had Jerry Lodegris came on here. We, we did have Jerry come on. And um, we've done, we have done some specific DSLR shows, uh, but I think in general the point is uh, we don't have to uh, demonstrate that. Uh, for a lot of us that have been doing it a long time and decided to commit the money to, well, I shouldn't even say commit the money, but spend a lot of money on our gear or accrue a lot of expensive gear and then say, oh, well, we need to have that. Um, some people come at it a different way, uh, and they may not be quite where we are yet. So yes, Andrew, uh, I think that's a great idea for a show. You, you know, um, Andrew, I'm, I'm not sure I buy your premise that what we're talking, a lot of what we're talking about is um, uh, CCD related. 
it may be that some of the images that we're showing you and some of the processing we're doing did start out as LRGB images or something like that on a CCD. And it may be that some of us are taking those, but other others of us are, in fact, taking lots of, um, of DSLR pictures. I know my Nightscape presentation uh, was DSLR based as much as anything. My um, presentation about um, uh, sensors uh, discuss what DSLRs do and what their strengths are and stuff like that. Um, my, uh, I, I, I don't mean to sound defensive here, like, oh, I did it, I did it. I'm not, I'm not, sound, not my point at all. Um, the, but that um, an awful uh, one-shot color, um, when we're talking about one-shot color, we're basically talking about DSLRs. So an awful lot of the things we do, we may have used a CCD to get the data in the first place, but the processing techniques we're talking about apply wherever you got that data in the first place. Once it's developed to the point where you've got your your uh, image there and you're trying to get some stuff out of it, masking's the same whether it's one-shot color or, or otherwise. So, so I, I, I'm not sure I buy the premise that the talks are mostly about CCDs. They're, we try to get everybody, and and you know, I think you guys have heard me say this before. We're always looking for other presenters. So if we got some people out there that want to bring us, you know, how do you cool your DSLR? Um, how do you get the most out of it? How do you choose your your ISOs? Um, yeah, bring it on. We you would just get contact Adam and say, hey, I'd like to do a presentation on that. Thanks, Alex. I did get one comment from Larry Groom. We need to get more people in the room. So I just sent everybody out there uh, who's basically following us at an invite. Uh, we can only fit 10. We have uh, seven right now. But uh, if you're out there and you want to get in, check your check your Google Plus. Um, and <laughs> yeah, Alex is saying Chris Gomez shoots with a D he thinks Chris jo Gomez shoots with a DSLR. So. But yeah, there are a lot. There are a lot of uh, people that we've had on that shoot with DSLRs. Um, I know I'm guilty of when I present uh, going into CCD speak, but uh, I've just I don't know. Ever since I got my CD, I really hit the ground running. Um, Bill Cluxton commenting that he uh, always shows his cell phone to not uh, shows his photos on his cell phone to non-astronomers. Um, uh, Tim, how feasible is it to, uh, uh, Tim is curious about solar imaging. How feasible is it to add filters to a regular refractor or other options in, anticipated, in anticipation of being ready for the solar eclipse of 2017? You have a couple options for that. Um, you can either do an H-alpha filter, read expensive, or a white light filter, read very cheap. Um, and uh, I don't know, white light filters are, are pretty cool. Um, now, uh, here's the basic thing. Um, a white light filter, when there are some large sunspots, you'll only see the sunspots. Uh, depending on the size of the refractor, you may, um, and the specific white light solar filter, and whether you're imaging or, or doing visual, you may be able to see a little bit of granulation on the sun. Uh, it's out there. Uh, you can see some great white light images of it, but I've only seen it come from like uh, SCTs with 8-inch white light filters, and they use a... I forget the specific... Um, the two options of filters are like a 5 and a 3 point. I've only seen it come from like... Uh, SCTA is echo. Someone's getting muted. Sorry, gotta mute you. There you go. Um, yeah, I, I don't quite remember the terminology of the past, but uh, basically, with a, a particular white light filter only for imaging, you can get a little bit of granulation. Pretty cool. But with an H alpha filter, you get uh, you get to see prominences. You get to see surface detail. Um, H alpha filters at twenty times the price are still pretty. Pretty cool, uh, um, and pretty well worth it. Go ahead. We've had that discussion in our, our local group about what to do on the eclipse, and I guess it's that uh, the group was going down to Indiana, and everyone says exactly the same thing. Those that have experienced it before, leave your telescope and camera at home. 
find a good spot, lay down on a nice lawn, experience the eclipse, and you'll take that the rest of your life. Or you can take your camera and telescope, be fussing with it, trying to take the picture, and you may or may not get it, and you'll miss the eclipse. There will be a million pictures out there of the eclipse, but there's only going to be one experience of you looking at the eclipse. Yep. Well, that's 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 the argument, uh, and I think that's the. Uh, <laughs> I think photographers deal with that all the time. Adam, uh, have you have you ever been to a total solar eclipse? Oh, not a total total solar okay. eclipse. No, no. Honest, what Eric just said. Photographers do that all the time. Um, you do not want. I mean, you want to. You want to watch the eclipse, um, and you do not want to. Um, you don't want to be worried about anything else that's happening. And I do want. I've taken some eclipse photos. Am I sh screen sharing now? Mm -hmm. Okay. There's an eclipse photo. Actually, that's about 30 eclipse photos, all put together. You need different exposures for different levels. If you go to my website. Uh, I think it's on my website. Let me see if it's on my website someplace. Where was my website? Where did I go with that? Uh, if you go to my website, I do have some hints about doing it. We were trying to arrange um, one of my buddies who's a really good um, uh, solar imager. We were trying to arrange for um, him to come on. And I'm not sure exactly what happened with that, uh, whether it actually worked out. Let's see. Is it? This is my website here. It's alexastro.com, and I don't think it's on there. Let me see what's if it's under articles. Um, here is, here is, here is, here is, here is an eclipse checklist. Okay, a checklist for um, how to take pictures. Now you have to adapt this to your own information, and this one was made. Oh gosh, a hundred years ago, probably for uh, 2006 or something like that. And here is what you need. Here's some information for you. This is information for me, uh, not information for you. And uh, as you can see, it's at alexastro.com. Go over there and you can find it. Um, what's that picture? That's not a picture. And I got some other pictures in here. Okay, to start with, let me stop screen sharing if I can here. Uh, where, which, which is me? Which is me? There, there's my screen share. There's my screen share. Uh, cancel the screen share. Am I back to normal? Okay. Well, yeah. such as it is. All right. First thing, what Eric said. Don't take pictures of the eclipse. If this is your first eclipse, go watch the eclipse. Don't worry about anything else happening. If you want to, um, you've got there are two parts of the eclipse to take pictures of. One is the intermediate stages. Those intermediate stages are all those stages where you're just waiting for the moon to cover the sun. During that time, you need a solar filter of some kind or another. Yeah, you can do it with a hydrogen alpha if you want it red and you want to see the prominences and all that other cool stuff. Or you can do it with um, any one of a number of uh, solar um, uh, filters that you can put on the front from Orion and um, Thousand Oaks and all those places. Probably the sharpest solar filter you can get in the cheapest is the uh, Bader Astrofilm. Get the visual brand, not the photographic brand, even though you will be taking pictures. Uh, get the visual brand because it makes for better pictures. Um, and get it now while it's in, still in good supply because you want to practice. All you're doing is taking solar pictures with white light in that case. There's a third option and probably the crispest cleanest picture you will get of all the options out there is a um, is a Herschel wedge and the Herschel wedges are, are uh, cost about 250 bucks and they fit on the back of your camera and, or the back of your telescope and you just take a picture and it's just simple as that. Put your DSLR up there and uh, take the picture and that's the sharpest picture you're going to get. But all that ends when it comes time to taking um, the actual eclipse picture. The total solar eclipse picture is taken completely without any filters whatsoever. You don't use a filter to take a picture of a solar eclipse because you're not taking a picture of the sun anymore. You're taking a picture of the surroundings of the sun. And in order to get that, you're going to have to have an expo exposure range of something like one 
thousandth of a second, one two thousandth of a second, all the way up through a couple of seconds, depending on what part of the uh, uh, picture you want to emphasize. And so you will have to take a series of pictures. Now you can do this all automatedly by actually getting a computer program to automate it, or you can put your mount, uh, put your camera on a tracking mount and get a 300 to 700 to uh, uh, focal length um, um, telescope if you're using an APS-C size sensor and uh, just take a picture. You've got to make a big decision here. If you want to get the corona, you're going to need something that will cover two, three, four degrees worth of sky and uh, that's asking a lot. So uh, be careful when you picture your, your focal length that you want, in fact, get that. If you want to take a picture just of the sun, you can use a much longer focal length because you're only getting the sun. But for heaven's sakes, you're taking a picture of the corona. And that's, that's what you paid your big bucks to see. You can see the sun itself anytime. It's the corona that you want to see. So get something that will give you a field of view of three, four degrees, something like that. So make, make it nice, put it up there. Um, there's all sorts of other stuff. If we can't get my buddy to do this, my buddy's a real good imager. I'm just a poopy imager, but I managed to take some good pictures of the of the soul of the soil eclipse. Um, if we can't get him to do it, I'll I'll go out and do a whole hour program on on how to take um, uh, solar eclipse pictures. But j just remember, there are better ways to do it. Uh, um, and the most important thing, if this is your first eclipse, is to watch the eclipse. Okay. Um, so just, just take that into account. Okay, that's enough for me, I think, isn't it? Actually, that was really informative. Um, yeah, and you've done it before, too, huh? I've done it about five or six times. You must chase these things all, I, I know you chase these things all over the world. It's fun. I, I, that, that one, that one that you saw was, uh, Egypt, I think. Yeah, that was Egypt. Actually, there's one more thing, one more bit of, uh, I'll make another case for not taking your camera. Um, Mitch Trilling, one of our group members, said that the last eclipse he went to, when he actually went down there, he watched the weather report, he figured that it was going to be cloudy where he was, so he jumped right in his truck or his van and took off 20 miles down the road and actually caught it. So if you, if you live in cloudy areas like we do, it, it's likely you're going to have to run to find the right spot in order to do that, which kind of works against, you know, setting up a telescope, which if you do that, you're kind of, you're stuck, you're pinned to that area, and if it isn't perfect, you're going to miss it, no matter what. Again, the experience is seeing the corona at the total eclipse, and probably most of us are not going to have many opportunities to do that if we want to do it somewhat locally. So watch the eclipse, leave camera at home. Oh, 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 I am, I already muted my mic. Okay, you're going to take a picture anyway according to, who is it, Sean? Yeah, Sean, you're going to take a picture anyway. I know what you mean. Just, you don't have to listen to my advice or anybody else's, particularly Eric's, even though our advice is the same. I'll tell you what you do, is you get yourself a tracking mount and make sure it's tracking. And you know where all your controls are on your camera. Okay, you've got a little thing in your hand, a remote control button, and you just grab your your uh, sensor or your speed uh, um, indicator, um, your shutter speed indicator. You know exactly where that is. You practice this beforehand, and you can um, take the picture with you know clicking, uh, and then just use your thumb to change the sp uh, shutter speed click again, use the thumb to change the shutter speed, click again, and on each click you get an under, you, you, you have bracketing so that you underexpose, expose, and then overexpose, and then you click. I click twice, and then it takes it up two levels, and then boom, boom, it takes the pictures, um, it takes three pictures again. And not once do I look down at the camera. I don't look down at the camera to see if it's working. I don't look down at the camera to see if I've knocked it someplace. I don't do any of that stuff. I've got a wide field of view, even if I've moved it a little bit. It's still pointed at the sun. It's already been focused. It's tracking the sun, so everything's fine. So if you're gonna if you're gonna misbehave, Sean, and you're gonna take that picture, no matter what, um, even though we told you not to at your first eclipse, then just use your fingers and your remote control button, 
watch the sun the whole time. Uh, you don't have any. You don't have to have solar glasses or anything on. You're just watching the big beautiful sun up there, and you're using your thumb and your and your thumb to take all your pictures for you. Just don't look down and try to fix anything. Okay, if it's broken, it's broken. Just enjoy the eclipse. And Jurgen saying, look around at your surroundings during the eclipse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what's the what's the time uh, the window? How long is the corona visible, or I should say, photographable? Uh, this one about two and a half minutes. It's it's uh, it doesn't show up until after second contact, and it's uh, there until third contact. You of course. Um, you want to remove your filters with, um, you have to have your filters on until about five or eight seconds before totality. And then you can pull them off and you're going to get Bailey's beads and uh, the diamond ring, the diamond ring, Bailey's beads. And then you're going to be in the prominences and you can see the prominences. And that will last the length of totality, which depending on what part of America you're going to be in, it's going to be about two minutes and 20 to two minutes and 40, something like that, seconds. And then, um, uh, and then you're going to go off to um, uh, about five seconds afterwards. You got to get those filters back on, or somehow cover your camera, or your um, uh, you can burn a hole right through your shutter on your DSLR. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, one of the other things to count about in this one, uh, it's always you know some people are going to go to Jackson Hole because it's a beautiful place. My personal opinion is that it's a beautiful place, yeah, no question about it. But you can't get both the beautiful place and a sun that is way up high in the sky. This, um, for this eclipse, our sun is going to be way high in the sky. It's not going to be on the horizon where you can get both the sun and the landscape. Secondly, unless you're magic, and there, there, you know, I've seen Dennis Mamana do this and a few other people do this, where they got a sun far off in the distance and then they can you can see the shadow around and then you can also see the landscape um, and that's good but you're not going to see the corona much all you're going to see is a um, is a bright or is a dark dot up there in the sky and and you can say yeah that's the eclipse right there and then see all the beautiful landscape around it you've got to decide what you're going to take a picture of if that's what you're going to take a picture of yeah, fine, take the picture of it. But if you're going to take a picture of the corona, which is what you pay the big bucks for, um, you you're not going to. It doesn't matter where you are in America that day. You can be in Jackson Hole, or you could be. And I'm not going to say any name here because I'm not going to denigrate any fine community along that eclipse path. Because you're going to be looking up at the sky, and when you're looking up in the sky, what's surrounding you doesn't matter all that much. That doesn't mean that there aren't pictures to take of the of the uh, shadow going across or of the uh, the funny effects of shadows and all that other stuff that happen. Um, no, there are there are you can do that, but don't do that at your first one. You know, do that later on when you've had a few of them and you don't have to worry about it. Also, what you can do is set things up automated so that they're taking these pictures every 15 seconds as they go on a tripod and you never have to look at it or touch it, okay? And while you, while you are doing that trick with the remote control in one hand and your shutter button uh, changer in the with the other hand, do those things and practice before you go out. Make sure everything's there and everything's working. And as Eric said, be ready to move 20 miles down the road. I remember um, I was at an annular eclipse on a on a runway in um, Panama, and um, the fellow I was with was from Germany, and we had clouds coming in. And we, in order for an, for an annular eclipse, you want to be it, you have to be even more careful about where you are because you want to be in the middle of the annulus so you get the ring all the way around and if you want that ring to be perfectly centered you have to be in the and it matters like a, a kilometer or two of matter of fact this fella had us walk about oh uh, 240 meters or something like that down the runway so that we could get where his GPS says we were exactly precise and after we set up and everything and got ready he said uh-uh, ain't going to happen. Clouds are going to come. Jumped in his car and drove down the uh, Pan American Highway for about uh, 10 kilometers. Whooped out, took his pictures, and yeah, he had clouds there too. Uh, I got some clouds. I, I finally managed to get something at the very end of the show, but um, 
be ready for anything, but mostly just enjoy the eclipse. Maybe we should do a whole show on eclipse photography. If we can't get my buddy to do it, we'll I'll I'll pitch in and do it. I think that sounds like a good idea. Now you have me wanting to try shooting it, and you just told me not to. Um, yeah, shouldn't this subject be? Uh, shouldn't this subject be a subject maybe closer to the actual event? Yes, it probably should, but uh, it's all oh, about preparation. Start practicing now. Yeah, good point. Good point. That stuff, start practicing it now. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, it's like it's like those parents that uh, they're in shows. They have these big iPads in front of their face. They they're missing the complete show uh, just to be able to videotape, but they're missing the moment. Yep. <laughs> I don't know though. You can automate this. You don't really have to hold the. Uh... You don't really have to hold the camera. All you have to do is get the filter off right before, or seven seconds in, get the filter back on seven seconds in. You could throw in some of the shadows as well. You're, but this is a one. This is a one-off event. You're saying that you never have to try this except once, and in that two minutes, you're going to do it perfectly. What are the odds? We can't even do it perfectly when we set up in our own backyard. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we answered your question. Can you add filters to a regular refractor? You certainly can. Any scope that you've got, you can add a beta solar filter to the front of it uh, for about 35 bucks, unless it's like a really, really big one. Uh, and uh, the other prices, as we mentioned, run up. But yes, you can do that. Just remember, your solar eclipse pictures are taken without those very filters. Those filters are only useful for the run up and the, and the uh, denouement. Um, no, I, actually, I think we covered all of his questions because uh, I think he asked it both ways, and we got a really thorough answer on the solar eclipse, and possibly we'll get a show out of it. So uh, that'll be that'll be a nice show. Um, a session on PEMPRO. Uh, all I'll say is PEMPRO three will be coming out soon, and I believe that Ray Greylack will be on uh, when PEMPRO three comes out to uh, give us a little demo of it. Um, at least that's what he offered, so we'll see. Um, okay. We are getting to uh, one of the topics that I thought about a lot and had very little to say about. Uh, how, and it got in a bunch of comments all based on the same thing. Uh, how about flexure? Causes and how to get rid of it. And um, yeah, and Christian's commenting, yes, flexure is a, gr a very good topic. He has this problem right now and is angry and cannot find out what causes this. Um, then another question on auto, well, question on the same note. Auto guiding. I have two OTAs mounted in tandem next to each other, a refractor, 102 millimeters, and an 8-inch SET. He try and guides with the refractor, but PhD has a hard time. Is the fact that the guide scope is slightly off from the rotational axis creating the problem? This problem seems to intensify, intensify when pointing south near the meridian. Um, it's funny that you guys below or above mentioned flexure. He just read about it, and it might be his problem after all. Well, yes. <laughs> flexure stinks, um, to be polite. Uh, I... Um, dealt with flexure and had no idea what the heck it was and had no idea where it was coming from or anything like that. Um, and I have an SCT, uh, and, and Alex is commenting mirror flop, but in a sense, flexure and mirror flop, in a sense, they're kind of the same thing. Um, because all, all differential flexure is is uh, the um, true axis of the autoguider and the axis of the scope you're imaging with shifts the smallest, small amount, smallest amount. And the auto guider can be on a guide scope. It could be on a finer guider. It can be on um, basically any uh, a tandem setup. Uh, it can happen any different way, and it only has to shift the slightest little bit for the differential flexure to show up. Um, so you can't guide with your tandem setup. Um, it's difficult. 
I used to guide with my um, Edge HD and my uh, William Optics uh, Zenith Star, um, and it would limit me to about five to eight minute exposures. Uh, not in tandem, but mounted piggyback. Tandem setups are a little bit more difficult. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm getting to that. Uh, so what solved my flexor problem? An off-axis guider. And I, I mean, I, I really hate to say it so succinctly, but there's going to be a point in your exposures where you, you just can't fight gravity, you can't fight the twisting of metal, uh, you can't fight the sagging of the mirror, you can't fight any of, any of that stuff. Um, it's just what happens. And then when you start pushing 30-minute uh, exposures, there's just no way. I would sometimes get an 8-minute exposure that looked good, and then as it shifted through the sky, some of my 5-minute exposures wouldn't be good. It's just an ongoing battle. Uh, with an SCT, you have the, the mirror to... Uh, you have the mirror to... Uh, uh, the mirror can flop um, on my and, and for beginners that haven't experienced this or, or don't know about it um, flexure or any sort of sag can come from anywhere focusers, that's why we buy all these rigid focusers um, the, the, dove mount, the dovetail mount um, I used to sometimes notice that some people with finder guider scopes we're able to guide longer than the people with longer focal length refractors mounted piggyback. And I think part of the reason for that is then you're dependent on the focuser on the, the wide field refractor, the type of mounting plates, the type of rings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so yes, off-axis guider, on-axis guider, they both, um, they are... If you've, come, if you've come to the point where you say to yourself, I'm having issues with flexure or I'm having drift that I can't explain, PhD doesn't see it, but I, I still have drift going through my subs, then I think you're at the point where you should go to the off-axis guider. Uh, it's a different world than it was five years ago because it used to cost you about $1,000 to get an off-axis guider set up with a good guide camera, and now I think you can do it for like 500 or less which is basically less than buying a piggyback refractor or anything like that. So um, I, I tried to speak a lot. The, the simple question is if you're dealing with flexure and you've identified it to be flexure, you're, you're, you can tighten stuff down, but you're not going to get it tight enough. You can maybe if you were to spend, if you have a wide field refractor, you're to spend enough money on a dual uh, parallax ring setup or a ring setup that uh, has it rigidly mounted. You can kind of fight it a little bit more, but you're always going to be fighting something. Off-axis guider, guide on a star that's right next to your field through the same scope you're imaging with, and you're going to take care of it. And, uh, yeah, I hate that answer because I hate um, spending people uh, other people's money, but at the same time, a year and a half, two years, I dealt, deal, I, I dealt with flexure. I just couldn't figure it out. I didn't understand why. Sometimes when I was pointing this way, it wasn't so bad. And sometimes when I was pointing that way, it was. It, it just didn't make sense. Um, yeah, that's, that's – uh, you're not the only one that asked it, though, um, Gene. There, there were a bunch of people, so I've been there. <laughs> um Okay, and I do want to remind you guys, you guys can ask your questions in Q&A because uh, the other question, uh, session on the dark art of guiding, and we did have Andy um, Galasso on, uh, who's one of the developers of OpenPhD or, or uh, PhD2, um, and um, he gave us one show, but he, he offered to come on for another show, up, so I, I will also reach out to him. Uh, we are getting into the summer lull. I'm kind of surprised we have so many people on tonight with 4th of July tomorrow. Uh, happy 4th of July, by the way. <laughs> hope, you're, hope you're not imaging tonight. It's not clear for me, but it's nice and bright out there with all the fireworks going off. You can probably hear them through my, uh, through my computer. And yeah, Sean, that's a good point. What's Flexure? Great, great guide graph, trailed stars. Uh, trailed stars that you can't explain. They're 
whichever axis they're going in, uh, doesn't show up in PhD, and it's just a slow uh, differential growing between the two setups. Um, Tolga asked how you identify flexure versus tilts. Uh, uh, a uh, non orthogonal of sensor. Um, so flexure will grow most likely with time, mm -hmm. whereas tilt would probably stay the same. That would be my guess. Mm -hmm. If you take uh, tilt is tilt. I mean, when they make a sensor, it's generally flat. Okay, so if it's tilted, it, the aberration at one side of the sensor is looks like this and at the other side of the sensor it looks different but it changes all the way across then you get then you get uh, tilts well the, the other the other thing that you can do is rotate your camera if you have a tilt issue with your camera and you rotate it then it's going to stay with your frame as but opposed it, it depends on the source of your tilt if the tilt uh, the act of rotating the camera may correct the tilt if if you are if the tilt is or Everything that is not sensor tilt is flexure of one sort or another. It's either it's either a draw tube um, sagging or it's a, a bar moving or something like that. But but there's only one true tilt, which would be the sensor coming, you know, not being perpendicular. And uh, what about field rotation? Throwing that in, what does it look like? That's actually uh, that's a good point. Because remember, field rotation, and this is stepping a little bit further, uh, field rotation typically, with when you're using a guide scope, um, looks like a circle around your guide star. Uh, but when you're doing... Which do guide star may be off, off the field. The guide star itself may be off the field. So the guide star may be off the field, yes. So, so cir circular around the guide star. Okay. If you're using, well, no matter whether you're using a guide scope or an OAG, it's always best to pick the star that's closest to your field of view. Um, but uh, I think Fletcher using a guide scope almost always looks like circles around that guide star, whereas when you're using an off-axis guider, uh, well, there is no Fletcher, but, or I'm sorry, field rotation. Um, but with field rotation around that, um, Field rotation with an off-axis guider tends to just look like a line because your star is pretty close. Uh, you don't, you typically don't get the circular motion out of it. That's been my opinion. Uh, that's been my experience. And and for those of you who may be looking at some of your exposures, looking for a circle or an arc, it may be so small that you don't actually see any arc to it. It's it's just an elongation at the scale at which you're looking at it. But if you take your first exposure of the night and compare it with your last exposure of the night and see what's happened, you may be able to pick up the field rotation. Thank you. Um, Did we mute somebody that was trying to answer a question earlier when we had to mute somebody? That for those of you who are just getting into the room for the first time or anything, we generally ride with our cameras and our and our microphones off in order to uh, eliminate excess bandwidth and to just keep things from getting confusing sometimes. So if we've muted you uh, and you needed to say something and that's why you got into the room, please let us know. Okay. Yeah, you can still unmute yourself, I believe. I, I think you can. Uh, so if you wanted to reach out and ask a question, that's the way to do it. You don't have to type everything in. Uh, we ju I just did it because I heard myself echoing. I don't know if you guys heard that, but it's really hard to think when you hear yourself saying what you were just thinking about. Um, I know I'm often embarrassed when I hear myself thinking. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, can you comment on a setup for a beginner astrophotographer? Uh, his scope is an 11-inch SCT on an EQ mount. Um, and there was actually a kind of interesting discussion in Cloudy Nights. Well, these discussions pop up all the time on uh, someone who was considering getting a an SCT and uh, I don't know if it was a C-Jam or whatever mount it was. And uh, we, we typically say SCTs aren't recommended for beginners. They're long focal length setups, which make it, which if you're starting in astrophotography, um, it's a tough way to start. Um, it's not impossible. 
Uh, some people will do it, and some people have a lot of luck. Uh, I started with an SCT and didn't really realize how difficult I was making it on myself until I bought a wide field refractor. And uh, he heck, I started on an SCT on an alt azimuth mount. So I basically started with the epitome of the wrong setup. But um, I think eventually, uh, no matter what you buy, no matter how difficult the setup is, you can learn on it. Um, that said, uh, if you said, where should I spend my money? I want to be an astro imager. I want to get good really quick. I wouldn't tell you to get an SCT. And I think for uh, most people, at least this is my opinion, um, you start with a good quality equatorial mount. And uh, as much as I like Celestron's products, the uh, I've never owned one, but the guys in the room have me convinced. Uh, basically, every astro imager that you've talked to that's owned one says, oh, no, or even owned both, says uh, Orion's mounts, they're, they're a little bit better. Sirius in the smaller, uh, for, the, for the smaller capacity. Um, Atlas for a little bit larger capacity. And um, a wide field refractory, uh, refractor or a moderately sized refractor. What's a wide field? 80, 80 millimeters is a pretty good size to start with. Um, you're going to you're gonna start taking good images right off the bat. Um, now, when you, when you ask me in general what's the setup I want, I, I don't know how much you know about it, and you kind of have to educate yourself in the whole astrophotography thing because you have to take into account your field of view. Uh, you might not be satisfied just taking an image of a wider nebula. You may want you may have a particular galaxy that you want to photograph, and you've seen other astrophotographers photograph it, and you want the setup that's going to let you take that image. Uh, and it might require something like an SCT. Uh, that said, um, I struggled with mine for a long time before I had any images that I could show to my fellow club members, and they would not kind of... Hmm. Uh, you, you can always get wows at work. Uh, you, you post them on cloudy nights and you're going to get advice. You're not going to get many wows. Uh, but it basically, um, a wide field setup lets you keep your stars round, learn all the steps and the workflow and everything that goes into it, save up some money, and then buy an SCT. Uh, but you heard earlier we were talking about flexure and this and that. Uh, there's a... There's a lot of stuff. There are a lot of unanticipated problems that you're going to have, and um, a setup like an SCT only makes it a little bit more difficult. Uh, so, uh, Adam, can I? Yes, Alex, go ahead. Question. Um, I think oh, I, I used to work with um, uh, Beginner's Corner up at RTMC, and uh, one of the questions we talked about is what telescope should I buy? And the first thing I said to everybody was, look. You guys all came up here, and, I, and some of you drove up in a beat-up old VW microvan from 20 years ago, and some of you drove up in a Lexus SUV um, towed behind your 42-foot motorhome. So I really don't know what money is worth to you. So don't ask me what you should be buying. You have to make some of those decisions. Also, personality-wise, you have to decide whether you are willing to put up with some of the minor frustrations of life that we all face. There is a lot, uh, there are a lot of frustrations in this. Or you would rather go straight to the top. Uh, before we got, we went on the air today, I think it was David um, or somebody was showing off his new mount. And uh, somebody else said that, uh, you know, the first time they, they got their mount working, it just worked. It worked so much better than their old mount. And all the problems they had had trying to learn other things, they didn't have them anymore. And it was just gone just, just by spending that extra $4,000. Duh. Well, okay, so don't ask me what money's worth. And don't ask me whether you want to go with through, through those frustrations. I would caution you, however, just another piece of old man's advice. I've had at least four people come up to me and ask me to what their equipment is worth and how do they sell it? And I said, why are you selling it? 
and they said they went into blank, blank, blank. I'm not going to mention any names here and said, I want to be an astro imager. Uh, sell me what I need. One of them was $7,000, another was $11,000, and they bought all the stuff to make themselves good astro imagers. And then they found out that it was hard. And then they came to me and said, you know, buy this stuff from me. And uh, actually, they said, sell it for me. And I said, I'm not going to sell it for you, uh, but you can sell it by going to Astro Mart and, and Cloudy Nights and sell it that way. They said, I don't want to do that. So the $7,000 set I bought for 2000 and the $11,000 set I bought for 6000 I think, okay? And then got rid of it, unloaded it in various ways. But the point is, you figure out what all that's worth to you before you go buying anything. And then, if if you're a normal, what did they call it, proletariat the other day on a, um, on the cloudy night, somebody was asking for a proletariat recommendation. And I can tell you what I would do if I were you, because I myself am a fairly cheap guy uh, fairly practical try to get everything try to get my money's worth I would buy I would decide what my expenditure level was I am assuming that you've already got a pick a, a DSLR around the house that you're taking pictures with if you don't have one then what I would I would start with a good DSLR of the uh, prosumer variety probably from Canon is where I would start um, the 70D is, I think, the latest one, but they're, you know, they're they're in various levels, uh, and uh, or 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 the whatever the hundred series are of those, even the less expensive ones would work for you. I'd uh, make sure I have a laptop around someplace, and with those already, then then I'd be prepared to spend about two to two to four thousand dollars more, and depending on how much money I had to spend over and beyond that. I would I would spend about 50 to 60 percent of it on the mount, the best mount I could find. And I've told you guys before, I'm not an equipment geek. I don't know what the best mount is out there. Other people can discuss that. God, it seems odd, odd infinitum. But um, I don't know those different things. But I would spend about 60 percent of the rest of my money on on uh, that um, mount, and then I would pick up a used um, refractor, uh, APO refractor, about 85 millimeters if I could get it, and I would pick up some kind of off-axis guider, and I would pick up um, one of the uh, inexpensive guiders, although frankly, if, if I knew I were going to be into it, I'd just go straight to the Lodestar 2 and, and leave it at that. That's about 600 bucks, um, or 550 or something like that, and that would be enough to get me going. That and a copy of, of BY EOS, Backyard EOS, uh, and that's the short form of it. Now, if you're going to ask me which mount you should be buying, sorry, I can't tell you that. I don't know them well enough. That's my answer. Make some of those decisions first, though, about what kind of person you are before you decide to go spend anything to get into astro imaging. Good point, and I'll say I'm a – I know, actually, I know a bunch of us in the room are actually proponents of buying used – there's a healthy used market uh, for astro equipment, and if you don't like something, there's someone out there who may, and if you buy used, you can basically sell it for, if not what you paid for it, just a little bit less than what you paid for it, and uh, kind of allows you to keep uh, the hobby, as I say, uh, budget neutral. So you've got a whole heck of a lot of money into it, but you can kind of sell what you need and buy something else. Um, On the topic of buying equipment, what recommendations do you have for shopping at astronomy retailers, not online? Oof, I don't have any. Well, I shouldn't say that. Uh, no, I don't have any not online astronomy retailers around me. I think I have to drive to Pottstown to find one, and I've never made the trip yet. Um, I don't know if anyone else has local stores that they uh, that they go to, but. Uh, that was a, a topic that hit my pocket really quickly. That's how they come in. I'm not checking my phone just for the heck of it. Go ahead, Alex. I live about an hour from uh, OPT, and I live about an hour and a half from Woodland Hills, and I see these guys all the time. As a matter of fact, I, my observatory site out in the desert, I, I see the guys from OPT regularly. Um, you need to support your local store. You're going to them to ask for questions and stuff like that. Um, 
the fact of the matter is your local store is probably more of an internet outlet than your than um, anything else. But uh, if you're going to go ask these guys questions, uh, oh, I also live about 45 minutes from Orange County Telescope, and Mike's always a good guy for us. Um, but um, you're, if you're going to be asking these guys questions and relying on their expertise, you got to pay their wages. So do it, um, either through their internet service or um, or by going to the store. Hey, uh, Alex. Yeah. Uh, and, and and this is Larry. Um, thanks for what they, <laughs> I figured out how to get in, Adam. Thanks. Um, and I'll just, on this subject of stores, um, I travel a lot. I travel for my <clears throat> job, and I do bop, bop into uh, pop into stores every once in a while. And the biggest <laughs> issue I have with them is no stock. Uh, a lot of them, they just don't have anything in stock. Now, OPT is different, and Woodland Hills is different. I've been into both of those stores. <clears throat> and one time I was in Woodland Hills, they had so much stuff stacked up that <clears throat> they are actually, they were, well, I walked in there, and I walked around there for about 20 minutes, and nobody said a word to me because they were so busy packing stuff to put on the UPS truck. But, yeah, Alex is right. You know, here in Minneapolis, we've got a uh, an astronomy store. The guy's pretty pretty good uh, promoter of it, but he just doesn't have any stock. And what he does is very basic stuff. So that's, that's always been my uh, uh, major but, disappointment. But he can get it off the Internet for you, right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, I get it. These are really Internet stores that just happen to have a presence. Right, right. And that, they're more than happy to ship it to you, but... I, you know, it would be nice to go in and get your hands on what you're looking for instead of, you know, having to wait for it to show up on uh, UPS. Larry, I, I've been to Star Arizona, Woodland Hills, obviously, OPT. Uh, I, I I was in Cyprus this time last year, and just for the hell of it, I walked into the only um, um, astronomy store on the whole island just because it was there and I wanted to see what an astronomy was like, store was like. I don't think, except for OPT maybe, I don't think I've seen a star that's bigger than your average 7-Eleven. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the guys, if, there's some guy posting on Cloudy Nights right now about he's coming to the United States to see the eclipse, and while he's here, he's going to go look at all the um, brick-and-mortar stores, and I'm sitting there... God, and what a waste of America's national parks, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple you'd like to see if you've been doing business with them, but my God, these stores are dinky little things. They're they're real, they're, like I said, smaller than most 7-Elevens. Yeah, uh, you know, Star Arizona, that was they're they've got a lot of stuff in there. They got stuff piled up all over the place too. It's all Hyperstar based, but they're okay. I mean, the one thing that you don't want to do is walk into a store and, and have the guy ask you, "What are you using?" and you tell him, "I'm got an AstroTech 106. They go, well, that's a piece of junk. You need to get, uh, <laughs> you need to get a, a Hyperstar and spend ten thousand dollars. You know, that's a wrong thing for a vendor. That must to be a Star Arizona story. Yeah, well, Star I don't, Arizona. I don't normally get them to do that. I don't get, you know, these people don't do that. But you know, I've been there twice. The second time they couldn't have been nicer. Same guy. So I, maybe I don't know. But most of the places, even in France and Paris, there's a uh, astronomy store right uh, right along the Seine, Seine River. And uh, I walk in there, and I don't speak French, and saw it. I don't think I've said more than two words in there. But they actually had some pretty good stock. Uh, this, you know, it was the first time I'd seen some of the cool European stuff, like uh, Stol uh, Officina Stellari and uh, ASA stuff. But all in all, most of these stores just don't have much. Don't have much stock. Most nothing to get used to your hands on, and it's all via the internet. <clears throat> well, I try and make it to Neath. And I get to see all the stock all in one place, uh, and I guess that substitutes uh, for me because even High Point Scientific, I don't think has a retail store like a walk-in brick-and-mortar store. I think they're basically just uh, send everything out. Um, you know, if I had a local store, I'd support it. Uh, I'm a I'm a local retailer myself, uh, and if you don't support your local businesses, then they're not going to be there when you do need something today. That you're gonna go in and pick up. Uh, you might save yourself a few days if we, if we had them around, but unfortunately, uh, we have a small market and a small number of vendors to serve the market. I live in Southern California. I've got 13 million people between me and the beach. We have three stores. You know, so um, there just aren't that many. When I say support your local astronomy dealer, your local astronomy dealer may be 2,000 miles away, but if, if you're calling so-and-so on the phone 
to ask them the questions, then order your stuff from so and so. That's what I mean by support your local astronomy guy or girl in the case of Farah out of Woodland Hills. Awesome. Okay. We, uh, I mean, we basically got all the questions that I found uh, below the uh, thing. Let me point out, next week we're doing Understanding MTF. Actually, John Hayes will be back on, uh, on Understanding MTF. Um, specifically, Understanding MTF, an overview for amateur astronomers. Uh, and basically, MTF, uh, well, I won't go into details about MTF, but if you know what MTF is, you probably know why I want to find out more about it. Uh, basically, it gives you a good way to compare systems, as long as you can keep certain things constant. Um, and uh, we've, uh, the topic came up as kind of a way to uh, determine um, how systems with central obstructions would compare to systems without. So, uh, <laughs> what does MTF stand for? Modulate, uh, modulation transfer function. Uh, basically, it, it allows you to compare optical systems. Um, not so where uh, Strel uh, only tells you so much. Uh, MDF tells you a lot more. Uh, and I believe that a lot of the lens manufacturers, Canon and Nikon, tend to include MTF charts with their better lenses to kind of give you an idea of performance. And basically, it, I think it basically determines contrast uh, in the system, uh, which is kind of what we're all after. Um, and I'm sorry, I've got, like, fireworks going on up there. So now, now it's not myself I hear. It's, all, it's a bunch of booms. Um, but yeah, so uh, that should be a great session for next week. And John is today's image of the week winner, uh, image of the day winner on Astrobin. Check out that photo; it's an awesome one. Um, but I haven't seen anything pop up recently. Anyone in the sh uh, in the room have anything to uh, share? If not, I'm going to thank you for coming. Uh, Surprise! We got so many people. Uh, happy Fourth of July. Uh, Tomorrow, I should say. Happy Fourth of July. I don't know. It's Sunday. I guess it falls in a good uh, a good day this week. Uh, but either way, uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks for coming, and uh, well, enjoy tomorrow. Bye.